So I'm here with Nathan and Sabrina. Nice to meet you, Nathan and Sabrina. Uh, where are you guys from originally? Uh, I'm from around here, actually. So you're born and raised in Red Deer? Well, technically I was born in Edmonton, but most of my life is in Red Deer, Lacombe. Yeah. I'm born and raised from Stetler, Alberta, the heart of Alberta. Nice. So how old are you guys? I'm, I'm 30. I'm 19. So where did you guys grow up? Well, for the most part, I grew up around Red Deer area, lot, lot, mostly in Lacombe, but most, but we spent lots of time in Red Deer. So I usually just tell people I'm from Red Deer. And how was it growing up in Red Deer? It wasn't bad. I was lived in a pre, I lived a pretty sheltered life for for the early bit. Can you describe what that was like? Uh, well, uh, Christian background, so church every Sunday, and we had Bible classes and stuff we went to, and no problems, because we didn't know about them. You <laughs> went to high school here, too? I was homeschooled all 12 years. Well, I didn't know that. That's kind of cool. <laughs> what was it like being homeschooled? Um, it was, it was good. I, I learned a lot. I like to think I'm a fairly smart individual now. But um, it was also sheltering a lot in some ways. Was it like your parents teaching you or did it was like a teacher? Yeah, company? pretty much. Uh, uh, they, my parents would get uh, school curriculums and stuff and teach us uh, what the books needed them to teach they would teach and other than that we just learned learn from the books and yeah it's really pretty easy. How was growing up in Stetler? I like um, lived there for the most first 14 years of my life um, we moved away in October to Daysland it's like a small very small community 900 population mainly farms um, lived in for my first foster home I was um got in the system at 13 lived with my best friend and then moved at a random house for about half half a year and before they moved me to a foster home because my it was working out between me and my dad and uh, then I went to a camp called Circle Square Ranch for a week and then my worker randomly picked me up not expecting and lived in with a police officer from Heller for five days and then came to Red Deer straight to the group homes. Uh, I've lived here for the past four years. Um, living in Stetler. I'd say it was like, you know, no, nothing you'd see around Red Deer. Like, it's very, you know, a great place to, to raise a child from definitely not seeing half the bull crap that you see around here. And can you describe what the group homes were like a little bit? Um, I'd say no fucking buddy should send a kid to a group home, honestly. It was, um, pretty whack, I'd say. Some pretty interesting stories, I would say, and... I've seen things that you wouldn't expect, and if they made a reality TV show on a group home, I'd say um, they get a whole. People would not. Be people fun to watch. It'd be fun to watch, yeah. <laughs> um, people judge and they assume when they think about foster system and group homes, and honestly, it's it's a whole lot different, and it definitely changed me as a person. Uh, but, you know, I didn't mind it. I just lived only in two here. One's actually just down the road over there by a block from the mustard seed. Semi-independent. Uh, you move in there between 15 to 17, and when you move out, you're expected to move out on your own. But it's kind of to be expected, you know, for uh, kids who are in the system. And with the two group homes that I lived in, actually Vantage Community Services, 
um, I've met quite a few kids who weren't actually sent there by like you know caseworker by their own parents what are some of the things that you've witnessed while being in the group home <laughs> um <coughs> I've witnessed, um, I'm still friends with this person, but first, uh, two weeks living there, even on video, I have two, the two boys that live there, they totally trashed the house and involved like, you know, serious drama that resulted between, at the end, at the end that, uh, the two boys ended up having a very much dislike for each other instead of being, you know, horsing around like they were at the start. And I've witnessed this very person in the bathroom, locked himself in the bathroom because a staff member walked out when the other boy was trying to kick down that kid, that boy's door. Um, he came out with a pocket knife, like, like, fuck, like, back off, like, you know? And the staff member comes out of the office just at that time, and so she presses the panic button, and that resulted, like, six cruisers, and I've, I've been, like, like had to go against the wall because they had, had to go past me and they had their like tasers at the door and they're like come out and I've 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 witnessed some pretty messed up shit I've there's this girl that I went to kindergarten with we ended up living with each other twice and me and my two like I call them my brothers we were laughing on the couch as she's taking all the pod plants or in the group home and like throwing them at the manager's head and the supervisor's head. <laughs> I, I, it's, I'd say it's been a, a while. I've come back from cadets and there's RCMP outside the group home and we just see a smash window at the th second floor and a chair in the snow. Did you enjoy cadets? Yeah, I loved cadets. I was in 1390 here in Red Deer, um, uh, Army Cadets. So, what led you guys to being homeless? Uh, well, you know, I, I made this choice to be homeless. No, I'm, I'm kidding. But <laughs> lots of time people treat you like that. Um, but what really started it, I think, is, well, for lots of people it's drugs. Lots of people it's, you know, bad luck or um, a combination of choices that and at the time seemed fairly innocent um, but I mean fairly common is you know you, you start smoking weed then you just start doing some cocaine with your buddies and then because you're doing cocaine you hook a brother up and then you hook another guy up and you start selling it and that leads to you know meeting some other people you stop selling cocaine just start living the party life and that turns into doing drugs every day, turns into using drugs like, like crystal meth, like heroin, whatever. Um, and then it's not really party life anymore, it's necessity drugs because you get sick if you don't have them. And that leads to spending money on drugs instead of rent, and instead of bills, and end up on the street. It's not exactly my story, but it's very similar to my story. Um, Do you mind sharing your story? Well, in a nutshell, that, that's pretty close. Um, I don't use heroin. Um, meth, I, 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 I use meth, but... Um, yeah. That's, in a very, very tight nutshell, that's, that's basically my story. Um, yeah. Mm, how about yourself? Um, so... <coughs> When you turn 18, basically, the like CFS, the government, they don't have to help you out anymore when you're no longer a minor. So you, as of 2006, there's this contract. It didn't exist before, so when you turn 18, you're kind of like thrown to the dogs, kind of with nothing if you don't have anything like you know, like a job or a stable place. And basically, I signed this contract, and you got in originally before. Um, they help you till 24 but now it's 22 and um but you got to search and follow certain like requirements on your so every contract is different between every young adult and work between them and their worker because it's um 
to you. Personalized. Yeah. And so if you don't follow those, like, you know, requirements on the contract that, the, um, you know, mine was I had to physically attend school every day and I can only smoke, like, smoke weed and drink alcohol, can't use any other paraphernalia, um, got to attend mental health, like, twice a month. If I don't follow those certain things that were on there, the, they can, like, pretty much cut you off. And it's every six months you come back to this contract, you make a new one. And I was living in a house actually, just uh, all the way at the down 60th year, and I rented there a basement suite for had a six month lease. And ironically, I got evicted. I got my eviction on the 3rd of March, and it's supposed to be out by the 18th. And my landlord specifically did it. So that because my lease was supposed to end up on the, end on the 31st of March, so if I get evicted before, she can take my like da ba uh, damage deposit and stuff like that. Um, my support worker wasn't being my worker. Yeah, I've had many parts to play. On probably I could have done made a lot of different choices, but my worker, my worker is a really strict worker. Um, around the government kids kind of known there's this one girl I met not too long ago she lives in the group home actually right now but um, she she asked me who my worker was because I'm like street person no nope. let me guess group home kid yep and she, and I told her Shannon Hedgecock and she's like oh I heard he's an asshole and I'm like See? it's not just me and she's never dealt with him he's just known for being not really he's like really strict but he if he doesn't know what I need or stuff like that he wouldn't pay me my check is what resulted in my like um, eviction uh, he told me he'd only pay me my March if I move into this McMahon Arcadia housing for young adults who are homeless well it's like he's trying to you know Make sure that the kids do it his way or the highway, and you know if if then he doesn't take the time to realize that different people have different needs. Like I didn't, I couldn't. Like I was moved out 17, only a month of being 17, being independent, and like this McMahon Arcadia housing, it's like a group home setting almost. It's not the staff members coming in for a couple of hours compared to being 24-7 that was my issue. It's living with girls around my age because I had a troubled time getting along with um, girls around my age. Uh, but I had no problem getting along with like anyone else. But they would just use me and or start drama that was not really needed. But basically that resulted into me being getting my eviction notice because no no check no rent and then I had problems with direct energy that's another part of my eviction notice but when I did the landlord to tenant dispute court uh, eviction yeah was supposed to be March I didn't actually get out to May because it's easy to get someone in, it's not easy to get someone out. You have to go through that court on the phone before technically they can get a bailiff or bailoff, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's basically a officer who pretty much gives you the boot. But What substance do you struggle with now? Um, I, I use side, which is meth. Uh, I first got introduced to living in the group homes, but I was almost clean for two years, and then my life kind of had a little bit of a jumble jamble, and I ended up using it again, but it didn't exactly result into, at first, being, you know, the reason why I'm homeless, 100%, and why, because... It was very much far off from being the reason why I'm homeless. Maybe not 
the greatest thing that, to help me get back on my feet, but it it helped me in a way to get go to school, be awake. But it uh, but the more you use, like how you said, you know, the more you become dependent on it. And uh, but I. I'd say at the start, yeah, when I relapsed, I was doing pretty okay, but we all know the spiral only goes down. How long have you guys been homeless for? Uh, off and on for the last two and a half years, three years, <coughs> but I mean, I've had, I've had housing in between there, but not for very long because well workers and landlords they get this impression of you when they first meet you that although they're going to give you a place to rent because you have the money there they see any possible way to get to get you out and you're back out on your ass again so it's very tough to keep housing after after you've been homeless kind of like uh if you're a, a, a convict, you know, it's people get this impression of you that you are that person that, that you were when you did that deed, and there's no changing that, but, well, things change. Or that you do the impression of pretty much that just because you do this, you're you're this. They, they give you a, a label, pretty much. Uh, what apparently, you find, a, like, I've had this Dude, talk to me and uh, whatever, what somebody we know. Him, um, he started talking to us and having a smoke. And he went to go buy smokes at 7-Eleven. And he's like, "Wow!" He's like, "I can't believe you guys. You guys are homeless. Like, you guys are such good people. Like, you're you're nothing like what you know everyone thinks, or respects, or you know just uh, just opinion opinionated. Like, they just." their viewpoint what they assume and he's like I wish like you guys shouldn't be homeless and we're kind of like just like anybody else can you describe what it's like being homeless I'm, I'm red deer. Deer. it's okay I've never been homeless deer, in Edmonton sir. but red deer I could tell you a little bit um, for the most part if you're homeless in red deer um, a few things are most likely true. You probably smoke meth. Reason being is, um, it it helps it helps with your time management a little bit in, in such a way that you know where normally you wouldn't have a whole lot to do because let's say you know I work into a place of walk into a place of employment to try to get a job. It's not so easy. Um, right on the. Right. Well, hygiene's one thing. It's it's hard to keep hygiene when you don't have a shower at your disposal. So I mean, for the most part, we all try to shower once a day, and lots of us are good at it. But sometimes you just can't. You know, there's just no available shower to use. You know, I've got a few friends that let me go come over and use their showers, but that doesn't mean they're always home. You know, um, um, another thing is um, on the job application, they're going to ask you where you live, and then we got that discrimination thing factor coming in where uh, oh uh, not applicable um, okay so you're homeless okay well, alright next I thought. you know um, that 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 whole attitude is very much prominent in the workforce uh, so when people drive by and they're yelling out their windows oh get a job this, well you know what it's not so easy it's just not it, I'd love to go get a job um then that other part of the meth factor kicks in because, I mean, especially if you're, if you're homeless during the winter, it's almost, a, in, in some small ways, it's almost a good idea to smoke meth because it raises your, it, well, they call it speed for a reason. It, 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 it increases your, your the, the speed at which your body's operating. Your body temperature goes up. It actually, it can, it can help you to keep, keep moving and stuff like that when, when you're really cold. You know, um, that being said, there's a lot more health factors that are bad for meth. I'm not trying to say meth is good, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, but 
there are certain reasons that homeless people do use it. Um, that being said, meth also leads to um, brain disorders. You know, it causes mad anxiety, mad uh, uh, paranoia. Um, uh, it basically abolishes your your um, your normal everyday task needs that you just got to do. Like when you get up, you got to you know make sure the house is tidy before friends come over and stuff like that. Kind of just falls to the wayside because you don't see it to be important anymore. Um, <coughs> where most normal people are like you're having friends come over, clean your fucking house, you know, and. It, it's 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 stuff like just that most most and I say quote unquote normal people, you know pe people that work that live the American dream, you know they work their job and you know have their nightlife, have their friends, family, whatever. And it's it really is a whole different lifestyle when you're homeless. What are some of the craziest things you've seen while being homeless at Red Deer? I'm not going really to talk about them. <laughs> we'll talk no, about no, the ones that no, are okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, I've seen some pretty crazy shit. Um, I've been, I've been, you know, around this street life for a lot longer than I've been homeless, and I've seen some pretty crazy stuff. But I mean, when it comes to the drug world, um, there's some stuff that are very stereotypical that people say, "Oh, he's a drug dealer. Be careful," you know. You don't have to be careful necessarily because he's drug dealer. You have to be careful about letting him, you know, being a rat about him being a drug dealer. You know, you don't, you don't, you know, tell the cops, oh, he's being a drug dealer. Because guess what? He's going to be pissed off if he finds out. <laughs> you know? So, I mean, then stories that are you know, stereotypical stories like that unfold, and I've been, I've been, in, I've been there, I've been part of them. You know, not so much on the dealing end, but, you know, I've owed money before. Um, I still have all my limbs, fingers, and toes, so that's all good. <laughs> but stuff like that happens, um, depending on who you owe and how mad they are, you know. Um, I have a couple of friends that are missing toes, missing fingers. I saw one of that happen. It's not cool. But it's stuff like that does happen, but it's very rare. You know, most of the crazy stuff I've seen is stuff like my cart. <laughs> I mean, I can put over 500 pounds on that thing. I built it all from, from basically a small frame. How long did it take you to build it? Not very long, actually. I found that the top half of it, is, as you can probably see, used to be a shopping cart, but I found the top half of it already in that condition. So I uh, mounted it on the frame with uh, my existing light cart, put a different uh, hitch on it because the existing hitch and everybody carried the weight of this handle. I put the wheels on it, from the bearings, and... Um, you should see yeah. the other cart. You should see my other cart, though. <laughs> oh, you built that one from scratch. I built that one from scratch. It is Cute. literally double the size of this one. Um, I think triple. It can't handle double the weight, though. But it is, it is literally a twin-size mattress frame. <laughs> yeah. Um, fully, full suspension on it. Like it's it's it's, it's as comfy as a, a like I can put people on it. It's as comfy as uh, riding a lazy boy. So, what are some things you think can be done to help other people in your situation? Well, first off, the biggest problem I think is discrimination. Um, if people would be open-minded, landlords especially, because. You know, the biggest thing is if we can get funding from the government, for example, to help us get off the street, which that isn't, there is funding in place. There is, there is ways to get that. And um, that's what the welfare system is for, right? Um, it's all a process. But once you get off the street, all of a sudden you're fighting an uphill battle against your landlord, against, and in lots of time against your, 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 wel your welfare workers because they're so discriminatory against you. And... I mean, I had a, quite the life before this homeless bit. Like, I've, I've, I was a business owner twice. I've got my ticket in mechanics. Um, I'm fairly well read, you know. I, I'm not just a, you know, quote, quote, homeless bum, you know. But it doesn't matter. That's what people look at you like, because 
well, I got a cart, you know? <laughs> or because I'm living on the street or because whatever it is, you know? We walk into Walmart and you know what? We don't have a house, so we carry a lot of what we carry, carry deer about on our backs and our backpacks. You walk into Walmart with a backpack, you are followed by three people at all times. Yep. It's it's just the cold hard fact. Because because of the whole drug situation, lots of homeless people are thieves. But there's lots of us that aren't, you know? And so the the thieves kinda wreck it for us. I you know I, I don't expect Walmart to change their policies. But because of the way some of us are, the others take the fault as well, right? But to be open-minded and treat each situation personally would be a big thing for, for people to do. Because people are different. There's, there's, you know, just because so-and-so did something and we're both homeless doesn't mean that I'm not the same sin, you know? So if anyone could help you, what would you want? No. I don't know. I have no idea. I usually try to be the helping hand myself, <laughs> if I can, you know, but obviously my situation d doesn't always permit that, but I don't know, if if someone could help me out with something, probably, I don't know, help me get my welfare in check, and or welfare in check, welfare and my welfare check, <laughs> whatever, uh, help me get my, the, like, my banking and stuff like that set up and off the street for a month and I'd be damn near ready to be independent myself, you know? You know, that's that's kind of where I'm at. But I'm also so, you know, well, you know, when someone goes to jail for an extended period of time, they become institutionalized, right? <coughs> so I'm kind of the opposite of that. Where I'm so used to living this life, it's, it's hard to imagine almost because I've been doing it for several years and it's every day. It's hard to imagine being off the street, you know what I mean? You get so used to it and so, I don't know, it's hard to say. How about you? Um, honestly, it's more of the, maybe if, there's got to be, like, more programs. Like... Or easier ways to follow them. Yeah, and the yeah. there is the, t the fact that, like, process. Like, the, like a lot of people over the summertime, they're the ones that did just get out, either housed recently or within the last two, three months. It, it, they had to wait, like, a th three-month process, and especially the older adults who are over 24, because... Unless it's your first time being homeless or, you know, you got certain things. Like, income is <coughs> one of the biggest things. And income support, it's, you, you, you don't get that much. Like, if you're homeless, yeah, they'll, they'll still give you something, but they, they won't give you a whole bunch, which then comes with the problem with finding a place to rent because yeah you can get that bumped up to more when you find a place to rent but it's not easy for when it's like hey yeah I get this I'm getting this amount but like once I'm housed like I'll get like you know more but uh, like people who are on H uh, they should be glad with that because H really does help with the fact that even if you are homeless and they don't give you the exact same you know you know, you, you would have this amount, but instead you don't have a house, so they give you this amount. The, it's way more than what income support would. But there's also just the factors of, like, you know, there, there's, the, yeah, there's the adult, adult, you know, health benefits, but those only go so far for people who are on no income, like, you know, or what, what covers your dental your 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 prescriptions for me like i got my glasses luckily just before i lost my um income in my place and my benefits and then someone steals my glasses well i can see but i can't see far 
and their glasses are not cheap. <laughs> Another thing is, is that like certain things with like you know the shelters, like at the warm up. Let's just say you're not necessarily ready to go to the bed at Safe Harbor, but it's like past a certain time where when you go inside you have to be sleeping, like go to, to the mat, like to the mats that they have, and. Well, it, it's definitely one of the major issues is charging, charging your devices, or just having a place, you know, to to um, be able to sit your devices down without them getting stolen. Or just even like you know sitting uh, outside of anywhere because there's no there's not really a place where you could sit on the steps. You can't sit in a place for long. <laughs> whether inside or outside, mainly outside, like this is what I mean yeah. for my example, out for outside, <laughs> is you'll just get, It's like, people call the police. It's kind of funny. We're not technically, as homeless people, allowed to be anywhere. Yeah. Seriously. If we're on any city property for any longer than an hour or two, the cops will show up because someone called it in that there's homeless people over there and, and cops will come and tell us to move along. Okay, so we move along to... <laughs> somewhere else at which the same thing happens well, it's like, where can and we, we go to the homeless shelter and, and they have that great big open parking lot uh, you sit there with, with your belongings for like my cart for example and all the stuff on it you sit there for any longer than two or three hours and they're telling me I gotta move and not only that but let's say I don't have a whole lot of bunch of belongings with me there's signs posted all around the homeless shelter to not um, um, what's it called again? The word's escaping me here. Loitering? Yeah, loitering. No loitering signs around the home shelter. Um, well, where are we allowed to loiter exactly? Where are we allowed to be? Because everyone loiters. It's just where you, where you want to. Where can you? You know? If you're not homeless, damn you're anywhere. As soon as you're homeless or you look homeless, all of a sudden people have a problem with it. You know? I understand if they have a problem with me, if I'm in your backyard, then sure, send the dog out, you know? <laughs> That's understandable, sure, absolutely. Great, right? but why not in the park? Or why not, you know, under the walking bridge? It's just the bridge, the, there's a nice grassy area underneath it, and no one really hangs out there, but when we hang out there, there's a problem. You know? I don't know, it's weird. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>